Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this special uh, press conference. My name is Brian Ullman. I'm the Executive Athletic Director here at the University of Maryland, and I'll be moderating today's press conference. Uh, joining us are three individuals from our athletic department, Director of Athletics, Damon Evans, Head Football Coach, Mike Loxley, and our Head Team Physician and Assistant Director of the University Health Center, Dr. Yvette Rooks. Um, this session will be recorded and will be available in the virtual press box following this press conference. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Damon Evans for some uh, opening remarks, and then we'll get to as many questions as we can from all of you. All right, with that, Damon, I'll turn it over to you for opening remarks. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, obviously, I'm sure all of you are well aware that on today, the Big Ten uh, did announce that Big Ten football will resume here in October. Uh, football is back in the Big Ten. And um, as you can imagine, our student athletes, as well as our staff and coaches, are excited about this opportunity to resume play. Uh, this is important for our staff. It's important for our coaches. And it's important for our student athletes as we move forward, as well as to this university as a whole. Uh, I know that our student athletes in the sport of football are eager to get back to doing what they love to do, and that's playing football. But as the conference made a decision to look at return to play, I want to stress that this decision was made under the guidance of medical professionals. The health, the safety, and the wellness of our student athletes remain paramount and at the forefront of the decision-making process. Under the leadership of our medical professionals, uh, we were able to come up with a set of protocols that are very comprehensive in, nat in nature and position us to move forward, but most importantly, position us to help to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to take care of our student athletes. And I wanna take a brief moment to share some of those protocols with you. First and foremost, uh, the conference looked directly at testing, uh, a point of care daily antigen testing that our student athletes will uh, do six to seven days a week. Should a student athlete receive a positive test from the antigen test, there will be a confirmatory PCR uh, to back that particular test up. So we're excited about those options for us to test on a regular basis and help to mitigate the spread of this virus. In addition to that, the conference looked at cardiac screening. A lot of us have heard about uh, how does this affect the cardiovascular system? And so what we've decided to do is put protocols in place to address those issues. One of the things that we're doing in the cardiac screening, first and foremost, is an echocardiogram on all of our student athletes who test positive for COVID. In addition, they will have an ECG as well as a blood troponin test. But what is really important or just as important as the three that I just mentioned is the cardiac MRI that gives you a visual of the heart. This screening pro uh, process is extremely comprehensive and puts our student athletes in the best position as it relates to being able to identify issues that may arise. I should note that in this screening, should a student athlete test positive for COVID, the earliest that he would be able to return to competition is 21 days. And again, this is done out of an abundance of caution. But as we continue to move forward, we felt that data was going to play a significant factor in helping us make decisions and setting some parameters around return to play and competition. So each institution is identifying a chief infection officer that will be responsible for collecting and reporting data as it relates to the team uh, positivity rate, as well as the population positivity rate. These are very, very important as decisions will be made as it relates to if we can continue to practice and or compete moving forward. Obviously, another big factor in all of this is contact tracing and to make sure that we have a comprehensive approach to contact tracing. I am very excited that we have parameters in place to protect the health and the safety and the welfare of our football student athletes. As I stated earlier, this was paramount. And I'm very pleased, as Brian indicated, one of the key members of that medical subcommittee that helped to lay out these protocols 
is our very own Dr. Brooks, who joins us here on this Zoom call today. Her efforts were outstanding and really helped us lead the charge to set up medical procedures or protocols that would be in the best interest of all of our student athletes. As we all know, college football plays a significant role in a university setting. It is not the most important thing, but it is something that people can come rally around. Uh, we can support the educational endeavors of the institution and give us a point of pride as we move forward. So again, we're excited to be back. Uh, Brian, with that, I'll turn it over to you and we'll answer any questions. All right, thank you, Damon. Uh, we're now gonna open it up for questions. I'm gonna ask each of you to raise your hand if you have a question, um, and then I will call on you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question directly. Um, let's start with uh, Alex. Alex from, and, and Alex Dacey, you're first. Go ahead and announce your name and your affiliation, please, and then ask your question. Um, hi, I'm Alexander Dacey. I'm from the Diamondback. Um, this question's really for anybody, but I guess uh, mainly directed at uh, Damon and Yvette. Um, so when you, uh, when you guys are um, going to get into this uh, testing uh, protocol and procedures and all that, if, uh, um, if an athlete tests positive, uh, where are they going to be quarantining and sort of how's the, um, how's the uh, quarantine process going to work uh, in that regard? Dr. Rooks, let's have, a, have, have you address that one. Sure, we've already been handling that and we've done a very good job with that, partnering with uh, residential life and campus services. So once we identify someone who's positive, they immediately get removed and they go into what's called our isolation dorm, which is Old Leonard Town. And they're there with their own bathroom in their own room for a period of 10 days, as long as they remain asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic, they stay there a bit longer to their symptoms resolve. And then they can come out and start our return to play uh, cardiovascular workup and then activities. All right, great, thanks. Daniel, let's go to you next. Daniel? Uh, hi, um, Daniel Yafusi, Bartimer son. I guess this is for um, Dr. Rooks. Um, I guess from a physician's aspect, can you just speak to um, what what medical information was brought to, uh, I guess, everyone's information or the, you know, the decision makers um, in the past month? to the point where, you know, a month ago it was safe to, it was safe, it wasn't safe to play, but now it is. Daniel, great question. You know, about a month ago, we were all just hypothesizing about what we can do. We were looking at what was out there. I mean, this playbook on COVID is being written as we go along. We have not experienced like this, something like this before in America, and especially how it is involved sport, sport from the national level all the way down to amateur sports. And so a month ago, a, a team was put together by our commissioner and by the college chancellors and presidents to investigate every aspect of COVID and how it affects anybody, especially the student athlete, and especially the football student athlete, because that was a sport that we're, that we're trying to get back initially first. And so we, we turned to our infectious disease experts, we turned to our, our cardiologists, um, and we all came together and formed these different task force that met almost weekly. The commissioner then brought us together and selected a few members, and we called it the Return to Act Safe Activity uh, Task Force to get us back. And we shared the information that we collectively had. We found out information about contact tracing and how it is different in each state and different in each county. Like here in Prince George's County, we have rules and regulations that they may not have in Baltimore County. We also talked to the top cardiologists and, and, and used experts from around the country, especially in the area of sports cardiology, and found out what's the best screening method that can give us the most information. So we came up with an ECG, which is a, a electrocardiogram, an echocardiogram, um, heart markers like a troponin, and then that cardiac MRI, which is all important to see if COVID actually affected the myocardium, which is that thick heart muscle that allows um, us to, to exert ourselves. We wanted to make that in place. And not only that, is we added a cardiologist consult. So no longer can the team physician clear someone, they have to be seen by cardiology. And one thing that we're doing here at Maryland is our team cardiologist is coming to campus one day a week to assist us with this process of doing echocardiograms here in our very own health center and providing those consults on our site so we don't have to travel, which I think is huge, but it will also provide the best health care for our student athletes. We also looked at that testing. No one in, in any of the conferences thus far is going to be testing six or seven days a week. So that was innovation. So the Big Ten showed innovation. We had a thought process and we shared information that had not been shared before. And we came to the conclusion with all those thought leaders that now we can put something together to our college presidents and chancellors and to our athletic directors 
that we can say this is the safest thing to protect the student welfare and their health and safety as they get out there and attempt to practice and to compete. Great. Thanks, Dr. Rooks. Emily, let's go to you next. Hey, Emily. Hi, um, this is Emily from the Washington Post. Um, I think this would be for Dr. Rooks, but if Damon wants to weigh in too, that would be great. Um, I was just curious if you had any ethical concerns about um, providing this amount of resources as far as testing to athletes and not to the general student body. You want me to jump in there, Dr. Rooks? Yeah, and then I can follow up. Well, one of the things that we are excited about with what we're doing is that the Big Ten has developed a cardiac registry that will allow us to uh, conduct research on potential complications as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, and that information that will be gathered will not only be shared amongst the institutions, but will be shared uh, with the local community as well. So we can come together and utilize that research to try to uh, identify the seriousness and the implications of this or complications of this particular uh, virus. So we're excited about that. We wanna make sure that we do our part in taking care of not only our surrounding community, but our state as well. And with what we've set up, we believe we can do so. Emily, great question. And that came up when we were discussing the availability of testing. And a lot of us are, who are team physicians are also primary care physicians, i.e. family doctors. And so that was key for us that we weren't taken away from communities or resources that really need them, especially the, the communities at risk. Um, I'm a proponent of the um, social inequities in, in health. And so I would not be part of a plan that was gonna do that. So we looked at that and made sure these were resources that are gonna be um, allowable and not to take away from those communities that need it the most. Great, thank you. Heather, let's go to you next, Heather. Hey, uh, Heather McDonough, NBC4. Coach, we're, we're gonna get one to you. Uh, <laughs> what, he's like, don't do it. Um, what was uh, the reaction when you, when you talked to your team? Um, you know, I know you have a lot of seniors, people who thought their career, you know, careers at Maryland might be done. Um, can you take us through that and uh, what that was like for you and your team? Yeah, we actually had a, a met today, had a team meeting, uh, kind of one of those emergency ones. And I can tell you, every member of our team was excited to get the good news. Uh, first of all, I want to give a lot of thanks to Dr. Rooks and our medical staff, as well as administration for, uh, there's a ton of hard work that goes into this type of decision. Um, all along, as I've stated from the beginning, you know, our goal is to play and do the things we're capable of doing by the rules of today. And today we've got, got good news. So I can tell you, uh, every member of our team uh, are excited about these opportunities, but also very grateful and thankful uh, to the Big Ten commissioner, the administrators, as well as our people here on campus who played a major role in getting us back on the field. All right, great. Uh, Pete, let's go to you next. Pete, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Coach, this is for you, Pete Gilbert, WBAL. Uh, can you just take me a little bit through the emotional roller coaster for the last 43 days and uh, culminating with today, which obviously leaves you pretty excited? Yeah, Pete, as you know, and you know, we've, I've talked about this all along, one of the things I've tried to do from uh, March 12th when this thing first started was for our team to maintain uh, the mindset of whatever the day allows us to do, that's how we'll, we'll handle and manage it. And we understood because this is something that has never, uh, we've never had to deal with before, not just in society, but also in sport, that the team that's able to adjust, the team that's able to be fluid, uh, will be the team that when the gates open, as I like to say to our team, will be prepared to go out and do the best job we can taking the next step as a program. So um, we've tried to maintain an even keel with this thing. Uh, we tried not to worry about what we read in the papers and, you know, all the outside noise, as we like to call it in a football family. And whatever rules that were given to us by our medical staff and our administration, that's, those are the things we put all of our energy and attention to. Uh, we were able to utilize very early uh, the, the meetings via Zoom. And then when we were able to get on the field, we've taken full advantage of those opportunities with the hopes that someday we would come to where we are today. And, and I can tell you, we're excited moving forward. All right, great. Next question is from Sharla. Hey, Sharla. Hey, this is for Coach Sharla with WSA 9. Coach, with um, the rules now in place that if a player tests positive, they have to sit out competition for 21 days. What have you said to your guys and these and your players to make them take this seriously, that they, they need to social distance? And I know, of course, that's difficult on a college campus. Yeah, you know, I really haven't had to say a lot of things to make them take it serious, Sharla, because our team has been – 
And I got to give credit to 18 to 22 year old young men. Uh, they've made tremendous sacrifices since they returned to campus on June 8th. Uh, we went into a pseudo bubble two weeks prior to the start of our first training camp. So these kids have made, a, these guys have made a tremendous sacrifice uh, to get to where we are today. So it isn't and hasn't been hard selling them on, you know, what, you know, Damon talks a lot about behavior modification, uh, which is needed for us to move forward. Obviously with the protocols that the, the medical people with the Big Ten have put in place, uh, it's of utmost importance now because it's not just us here on campus that our players understand the importance of uh, minimizing their ability to, 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 to catch COVID. Um, unfortunately, we'll deal with COVID as long as it's here. And as Damon says to our team, uh, it's nobody's fault when they catch it, but we wanna do everything we can to mitigate it. And we do that by the basic fundamentals like we talk about in football. You know, wash your hands, wear your mask, stay six feet, and just continue to reiterate those things. Also, the new challenge of maintaining uh, your sort of close bubble of friends and family uh, to protect us all when you uh, come into our building. Great, thanks. Uh, Darren Haynes, we're gonna come to you next. Go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Hey, uh, this question's for uh, Coach Loxley. Yeah, Darren Haynes, up here night. How you doing, Coach? Uh, uh, my, my question will be, um, as a coach, you're, you're like that father figure to a lot of young men. And I'm wondering, because you're taking care of the kids of parents, what conversations have you had with maybe their parents to make sure you are going to make sure their son stays healthy? Yeah, you know, one of the best things that we have going is obviously uh, our administration has played a major role when it comes to everything medical. Um, I'm going to follow the protocols to a T that, you know, our medical people here on campus and what the Big Ten medical uh, people have put in place. Um, I know we've had multiple Zoom calls with parents. I think we've got one scheduled for tomorrow as well to go through these same protocols as to where we are today. I think the key to all of this is communication and sometimes over communicating. Um, and so the direction of our medical people and Damon and his staff have really taken a lot of that off my plate. You know, I'm here to be the football coach and with the medical piece, it's my job just to make sure that I follow and, and, and follow the lead of the protocols that they put in place. And um, that's what we choose to do. Thanks, Coach. Next question is going to Alif. Alif, go ahead and unmute yourself, and you can ask your question. How you doing, Coach? Uh, this question also can go to Mr. Evans, if that is okay. Um, the question I had was, has there been any conversation about the what will be done for the athletes that have already opted out for the season, whether they will have the option to opt back in? Locks, I know, I know you pointed to me, so I'm just going to sit here and say this. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll take a look. First and foremost, student athletes that did opt out, uh, their scholarship remains intact as we as a Big Ten agreed to do that. The University of Maryland agreed to do, to do that prior to the Big Ten uh, mandating in the NCAA. So we felt that was the most appropriate thing to do. As it relates to a student athlete status regarding opting back in, uh, we leave that up into the coach's discretion. So Locks will make decisions based upon what he feels is most appropriate uh, for his team. So I'll turn that over to Locks. Yeah, I mean, Damon hit it right on his head. I mean, we're very supportive uh, of any player, whether they chose to opt out or the kids that remain opting into the program. Um, you know, what I've found is because of things being so fluid, it's important to, to bring in if, if it were to arise or if a guy decided to want to opt back in, uh, we bring those guys in, we talk, we have a conversation, and we make sure that for both parties that it's the best situation for us all moving forward. But again, uh, the importance of supporting them academically, supporting them mentally, and all those other things, those things have remained intact and they will remain intact whether they choose to play or not play. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Damon. Next question is from Ike. Ike, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure. Thanks a lot, guys. This is for Dr. Uh, Wilkes or Mr. Evans or anyone. Uh, just referring to the recent outbreak in the athletics department here, uh, I know we were waiting to properly start the season in a safe manner. Uh, even though the guidelines provided by the Big Ten, uh, in your best opinion, do you, still, do you still think it's a good idea to continue in such short time, given the recent spike in COVID cases we've had on campus here? Dr. Rooks, why don't you take that one? 
Sure. Um, great question, Ike. You know, we, we're looking at things as a whole within our athletic department. We're also looking at things by team. And our football team has done a great job over the summer with their numbers of positives. And most recently, they probably have the lowest positivity rate of our, of our teams with a large number. So I'm confident in moving forward. And we've kind of kept our teams together, um, especially, you know, their living arrangements may be a little different, but we are actually still doing virtual meetings. We're still practicing, you know, that six foot distancing, wearing our masks and preaching that. But overall with our football team, our, our positivity rate is quite low. So if you look at things as a whole, those sports that have a high positivity rate are not doing anything right now. So this wasn't an all, all, all in. We are looking at things individually. If you want to call them by clusters on teams, you can say that. But in terms of football, we're in our green zone so we can go. Great, thank you. Uh, Olivia, let's come to you next. Uh, Olivia Garvey, ABC7 Sports. Uh, this is for Coach Loxley. I, I can't imagine how these guys felt this morning when they heard that they were going to have a season. What was it like to in that locker room where the text messages you received from your players this morning? Yeah, unfortunately, as Dr. Rooks alluded to, there's not much of us all together in a locker room. So <laughs> you don't get to feel the emotion. Uh, the virtual excitement. <laughs> I know that Damon asked the question of our team. Uh, when he joined our team meeting, is anybody excited? And I can tell you, uh, we had a lot of guys chime in. You know, these kids have really, as I said before, made a tremendous sacrifice to get here. As I've said, you know, 18 to 22 year old young men uh, on a college campus to have to make some of the behavior modifications that come along. You know, you always talk about academically, athletically, and social, where the social piece is the piece that has been really limited by our players, and we hope to continue that, which then allows us to keep moving forward as a program. I mean, we've gotten through once, you know, one barrier of getting football back, but we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us because COVID is here and we got to do our part uh, to follow the protocols that they set. Um, as the leader of the program, I've got to do my part to make sure that it's happening. And then as I told our team, it's, you know, if one fail, we all fail. So there takes some accountability from within the team to police each other to remind each other to do things the right way with the right kind of behaviors. Thanks, Coach. Uh, as a reminder, you can uh, raise your hand by clicking at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll keep going here. Kelsey Mannix. Kelsey, you're up next. Hi, I'm Kelsey. I'm with Capital News Service. This question is for uh, Coach and Damon, if he wants to chime in too. Um, what have you guys been doing to prepare for the possibility of playing in front of less or no fans? And how have the players adjusted to that idea? Um, I guess I'll start one, you know, for us, we haven't done a lot to prepare for no fans. Uh, we've had, I want to say maybe eight opportunities since uh, the Big Ten made the decision to go out and practice. And what we've tried to do is focus on the things we control. Uh, Prior to being able to practice, the, the, the focus was on uh, mentally uh, improving our team, improving our football intelligence. And then once we've been able to go out and practice, we've really focused on the fundamental piece of it. So uh, things we don't have control over is the, our fans in the stand. And I'll do my part as the leader of the, of the football program to talk about we compete against the opponent. Um, and we don't let external back factors factor into how we play and how we go out and do our business. So for me, that's easy. Damon, you want to comment on, on, on no fans? Sure. You know, all along, we knew that that was a possibility. When you take a look across the country and the sports that are in play right now, uh, fans have really, really been limited. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we work with our, our local county government and the state government to do what's most appropriate to protect our communities as we move forward. So we knew that was a possibility all along. Uh, we more, were more focused on trying to get the medical protocols in place uh, that would protect our team and allow our team to get back to competing. So it will be a little bit different without fans, uh, but I know I received a, a lot of uh, text messages and emails today from fans uh, expressing how excited they are about us getting back and the opportunity to watch the Terps on TV. All right, thanks. Uh, Heather, Heather Dinich, let's go to you. Heather Dennis with ESPN. This question is for Dr. Rooks. I'm sure this was probably one of the wildest past weekends in your career. Can you just kind of paint a picture as to what it was like? You froze a little bit, Heather. I couldn't hear you. Heather froze. 
because yeah. the, the heart issue was a big one, obviously. What were their questions? Part of your question, Heather, I didn't get because you froze, but I think you asked me, how was the weekend? You know, all the questions. I, I just want to say it, it was kind of exciting for me. You know, I'm a sleuth for information. Again, being a family physician, we kind of need to know a lot of stuff. And I got to meet some really cool people throughout the country. We're sharing ideas. So I learned a lot. I contributed a lot. I think that the commissioner and I have a good working relationship. And so he trusts my opinion. Um, I know I have a, a, a lot of transparency um, with the athletic department here and with my boss at the health center. So there's this value of, you know, sharing information and putting it out there. I think Maryland has a voice in the Big Ten when it comes to medical decisions, and I'm happy to be that voice. Um, when it came down to the cardiac piece, um, I want to say that Maryland is on the map because um, Jeffrey Rosenthal, who's the director of pediatric cardiology at the School of Medicine, one of our partners, um, is leading up, is one of the leaders of the cardiovascular task force. And we're going to be the hub site for the cardiac MRI imaging. So we'll be reviewing all the imaging that will be coming in. So I'm, I'm excited about that because I know that Maryland is going to have an active part. And with our partners of, with, up at UMMC, um, we have the best in the world. And so not only are we going to be contributing to Maryland athletes, we'll be contributing to the athletes at all in the Big Ten. Thanks, Dr. Rooks. Uh, JJ, let's come to you next. Thanks, uh, JJ Regan, NBC Sports Washington. Uh, this question is for either Coach Loxley or Mr. Evans, whoever can best answer it. Um, the Big Ten has proposed a nine game schedule through nine straight weeks for, of the teams that are already playing. We've seen a number of postponements already. What are the contingency plans if a game does have to be postponed? Does it just need to be canceled? And what's the level of concern that this could happen? Damon, let's start with you. Okay, uh, very, very good question. Obviously, we have not released a schedule as of yet. There is consideration be given, being given to uh, eight to nine games out there. Uh, we'll continue to evaluate that, knowing that we need to get a schedule out here sooner rather than later. But one of the things that we are, uh, we feel good about is daily testing, uh, we hope, will put us in a position to really be able to contact Trace and to more specifically provide a clean practice area and a clean field and limit uh, the spread of the virus amongst uh, teammates moving forward. So we will deal with things as, as they come. Uh, obviously, it is going to be a tight window for us based upon how we decided to come back in play. So once we get that schedule set, which it is not set yet, uh, when we get to take a look at that schedule, then we'll have to start having further discussion on what happens if this goes awry or if that goes awry. All right, thanks. Let's go to Don Marcus next. Don, stuff and ask your question. This is for Damon. Uh, and and following up on Emily's question earlier in terms of the testing, uh, is the Big Ten paying for this, or is Maryland paying for this? And if so, if Maryland is, um, where are the funds coming from? And if there's an estimation on how much it's going to cost with all the antigen tests and as well as the cardiac, the, you know, the, the heart. Uh, great, uh, great question, Don. It's good to see you as well. Uh, yes, uh, we will be responsible for paying for testing. Um, each institution in the, in the Big Ten will be responsible for, for paying for the tests that we utilize moving forward. As you might imagine, it could be quite expensive. I don't know the exact dollar amount uh, right now, uh, Don, but I, if I had to take a guess, it could be somewhere from uh, 700 to uh, a million per institution uh, to do this type of testing uh, as comprehensive as we want to be. And when you're dealing with a medical and looking out for the health and safety and the welfare of our students, uh, this is what's most appropriate. So we've committed uh, to do so, and uh, we will have to, to find the funds to make sure. And as we go through these tough financial times, uh, there are areas in which we need to spend money, and spending money on the, the health of our student athletes and protecting them through this is of significance. Thanks. Thanks, Damon. Let's go to Leela next. Um, my question is for uh, Coach Loxley. Lox, how are you? Hi, what's up? Um, what you mentioned only having eight practices with such a short, you know, period of time to get ready for the season. What are the kind of challenges with that, and uh, you know, what you want to be able to focus um, on with the team, just having uh, some such a limited period? 
Yeah, you know, I don't see it as a short short time frame for us, Lila. Uh, we've got five weeks, I think, uh, from you know next week to where uh, October 24th lays about five weeks away, and typically to get ready for uh, your season, you know, a, a normal August for us, we would usually get 29 opportunities to practice and go out and uh, prepare our team. You know, I think the challenge for us will be. Uh, making sure uh, we're smart with how we practice, uh, how we do all the things we possibly can to, to mitigate the opportunities for our players to, uh, you know, to track COVID so that we are able to get to the game healthy. Um, you know, the next couple of weeks are really important for us that our players continue to do the things from a behavior standpoint to get us to where we are in that testing every day uh, area of time. And, I feel like we'll have enough time for me. Three weeks has always kind of been the, 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 the necessary time to develop the callus you need to play the game uh, from a physicality standpoint. And so I feel very comfortable with the time frame and the window we have to be able to uh, have the team prepared and ready to go. Great. Thanks. Uh, next question for Josh Rosenthal. Josh, you're on next. All right, thanks. Uh, this question would be for Dr. Rooks. Uh, you mentioned that the football team had a low positivity rate as compared to the rest of athletics or, or other teams in particular. Do you have specific numbers for the football team's positivity rate or positive cases, whichever metric you think is you think is best as it relates to the overall athletic program at Maryland? So, oh, Jonathan, I, I have to be careful not to violate HIPAA. If the numbers are that low that they can self-identify. So I'd rather not say, but say that, you know, you are under what the state would consider 5%. Great, thanks. Uh, Emily, let's come back to you, Emily. Hi, um, this is for Damon. Um, I know you guys have been forecasting since March uh, what the impact would be on the athletic department from a financial standpoint. Um, now that we have some clarity um, with the football season, what what are you expecting um, for for just the overall picture um, moving forward? Um, as we talk to some of our staff today about this, this is a very good question, Emily. Obviously, playing football will allow us to recoup some of the revenue that we were uh, losing if we did not have a season. But it's still going to be a tough financial situation for us uh, moving forward. Obviously, if it's an eight or nine game schedule or what have you. Each game has a certain value to it. We were projecting somewhere around a 60 to maybe $65 million loss uh, with regard to no football. Uh, I think we can recuperate some of that. I don't know the exact numbers. I don't think we can. I know we will recuperate some of it, uh, but we don't know the exact numbers because we're playing in different television windows now. We're starting our season late, but we're working with the television partners to figure all that out and negotiate uh, in the best possible manner to benefit not only the, the conference, but the member institutions. Uh, Don, let's come back to you, Don. You have to unmute yourself, Don. That's what I did. <laughs> Mute yourself You're again. still muted. Mute yourself again. Technology, Don. OK, we good? Yeah. yeah. All right. I do this every week in my class. I should be good with this already. Uh, Mike, in terms of as a coach, is there a way to to keep your team in a bubble uh, on a college campus? I, you know, I know they're taking classes remotely, but how tough is it to monitor that uh, in time in terms of trying to keep them safe? Yeah, I mean, again, everything. Hey, hey, Dave, Dave, can you please mute? Thank you. Go ahead, Coach. Sorry. We, we've tried everything we can to continue to educate our guys on the behavior modification piece of, of making good, smart decisions on uh, your social life and, and how you manage that piece of it. To, uh, to put a team in a bubble at the college, uh, in, in the college game is tough. Uh, these guys like, have normal lives. They have to live. But we've done everything we can to encourage them to be smart with the, the, the fundamentals of mitigating COVID. Uh, when they do have to leave, wear masks to keep their six feet distance, to wash their hands, to limit themselves to big groups. So uh, we have just stressed that piece of it. Um, yeah, it's definitely challenging to create a bubble for uh, 18 to 22 year olds on a college campus where you have outside variables that you don't control or can't control. And so all we've tried to do is educate our players on how to best 
mitigate those opportunities to contract COVID. All right, thanks. And I think we have time for one more question and it's from Darren. Darren, let's come back to you. Uh, hey, Coach Loxley, uh, you're, you're probably gonna get on me for this one because I know you're big on uh, leaving the past in the past, but it's, it's very important because, uh, you know, Damon was also around and Damon can answer this, um, you know, the death of Jordan McNair. And you guys have done a great job in making sure it's health uh, safety first. What conversations have you guys had with maybe other teams uh, to let them know um, how important this safety uh, measures are in regards to taking care of your students uh, moving forward within this pandemic? All right, you want me to jump in there, Locks? Yes, yeah. That'd be All right, Darren, that's a very, very good question because obviously the tragic death of George McNair uh, is something that we never forget around here. Uh, we've had to, to learn from that and move forward. Uh, and, and it's at the forefront. The health and safety and the welfare of the student athletes at the forefront. Uh, I did have conversations at the conference level when we were discussing, discussing uh, this issue of COVID-19 and the spread and the unknown complications and the effects that it could have on young people. And when you go through something like we went through at this institution, you're very, very mindful. We are always had health and safety at the forefront, but it, it becomes even more paramount. So I felt it was necessary for me to share that with my colleagues in the Big Ten uh, so that they would understand what we were dealing with. And all along, we at the University of Maryland, uh, as, as much as we wanted to play football in all of our sports this year, they weren't gonna be played unless we felt comfortable that we were in a position not only as an institution, but as a conference to move forward in a safe manner. And today we feel good that we're in that position and we feel good because we have a great medical team uh, headed up by Dr. Rooks. Coach, anything you'd like to add to that? No, oh, I mean, yeah, uh, been, been a part of a lot of Zooms with our uh, head coaches in this league and, and it, has, it had come up. Um, and the conversation, obviously, uh, the relationship I have with the McNair family. And, you know, I can tell you that Dr. Rooks, who leads up the, the protocol stuff for us here, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there would be no way that we would go back out as a team uh, if we didn't feel that we could do it safely and have the welfare of our student athletes in the forefront because of what we've gone through. Now, we've continued to try to move forward in the right way. And I think, as I've said before, because of what's happened, with Jordan here, that's enabled us to be, as Dr. Rook said, I mean, we're, we're, we're at the forefront of leading the charge for the health and safety of not just Maryland athletes, but athletes across our conference. And so um, that conversation has, has taken place uh, to a degree. And, and again, there's a comfort level knowing that the people that are making the decisions on how to get us back safely uh, took these things into account and again, we're able to get our players back on the field safely, healthy, and, and with their welfare, uh, first and foremost. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Coach. Thanks, Damon. Thanks, Coach. All right. This is going to conclude the press conference. As a reminder to everybody who joined us, the re a recording and a transcript of this press conference will be available uh, on the virtual press box uh, shortly after this call. Also, we put some B-roll from a, from a practice from, uh, from early August on there, too, for your use. Uh, I'd like to thank Coach Loxley, Dr. Rooks, and Damon for joining us. And Damon, I want you to give you—I want to give you the opportunity to make any final remarks. Well, thank you, Brian, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us uh, today. I, I just simply want to say this: um, we did not enter into this decision lightly. Uh, the University of Maryland had to take a look at what is his, what is in its best interest, and in conjunction with, or coordination, I should say, with uh, Dr. Daryl Pines. Uh, our medical people, uh, we really worked hard at this. And we've been communicating with parents on a regular basis, which we'll do again tomorrow. We've been communicating with our student athletes on a regular basis with all intent to protect them from this virus, as well as just playing the sport that they love uh, to play. Our true MVPs at this time are Dr. Rooks and our medical staff for all the protocols and the things that they put in place. And the one thing I wanna assure all of you here is we will not sacrifice when it comes to protecting the health, the safety and the wellness of our student athletes. We have to keep it at the
the forefront. While we are excited to get back to playing football, and while we want to get our other sports going as well, we're going to continue to monitor, monitor this virus and do what's in the best interest of the student athletes that represent this great institution. So again, thanks to Dr. Rooks. Thanks to all of you uh, for joining us today. Someone said it's been a roller coaster. It has been a roller coaster, <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to continue to a certain extent, but I know the Big Ten have put together a set of comprehensive protocols that best position us to move forward. And to the Big Ten office, Commissioner Warren, and all those involved in my colleagues, I am grateful for their time, their energy, and their commitment to this endeavor. All right, with that, we will sign off. Thank you all for joining us and look forward to a good season. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Go to see all of you.